In this session, I'll seek to address the challenges of Islam and the Christian response to those challenges. What I'm going to discuss is the theological as well as political and military challenges of Islam. I'll start off with some of the theological challenges that Muslims are presenting against our worldview, against our beliefs concerning the nature of God, the person of Christ, the authority of Scripture, as well as the plan of salvation, how Islam is seeking to challenge our beliefs concerning these issues, and how to respond to these challenges. Let's begin with the authority of Scripture. Muslims believe that God, Allah, sent through prophets and messengers various books, specifically the Torah of Moses, the Psalms of David, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and finally, Allah, God, sent down the Quran as the final Scripture, the complete Scripture, the perfect Scripture that abrogates, consummates all previous Scriptures and revelations. Now with that said, you would think that Muslims believe in your Bible, so that anytime you quote a specific chapter or verse from the Holy Scriptures, that Muslims are obligated to believe what these Scriptures command. Well, not so. See, Muslims believe that the prophets before Muhammad taught the same truth, brought the same religion, brought the same understanding concerning the nature of God, the nature of man, and salvation that Muhammad did. Yet when they turn to our Bible and read what the scriptures say concerning the nature of God, the person of Christ, and the way a person is saved, they see that there are fundamental differences, glaring contradictions between these two scriptures. So now, how does a Muslim respond to these contradictions? Well, the Muslim is taught to believe that we have corrupted the scriptures that came before the coming of Muhammad. In other words, Although we believe that we, can, we have in our possession the revelation given to Mus Moses, Muslims, on the other hand, believe that those revelations were corrupted so that what you find in the Old Testament is not the original, pure, pristine teachings of, Mo of Moses. In a similar fashion, when Muslims look to the New Testament and see the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are quick to say that that is not the gospel given to Jesus, which he passed on to his communities. These are gospels written by men that reflects their views and ideologies, but is not the original revelation that God gave Jesus to give to us. In other words, the Muslim position is our scriptures have been corrupted. So anytime you quote a text from the Bible that says that Jesus is the Son of God, or that Christ died on the cross and rose again, the Muslim will be quick to respond, those are the portions of the scriptures that you corrupted. These are not the teachings of the prophets such as Jesus. Now, that, that's a challenge. That's a challenge to the Christian to prove the veracity of their scriptures, because after all, if our scriptures are corrupt, we have nothing to base our beliefs on. If my Bible is corrupt, I really have no leg to stand on as a Christian, so that I cannot prove to a Muslim that what I hold to be revelation from God is truly from God if the Bible has been corrupted. And so this is the challenge that we need to address. Now how can we address this challenge? How can we show our Muslim neighbor that our scriptures are not corrupt and that these are the revelations that God gave through the prophets and messengers, specifically through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, one effective way of doing this is by pointing to the Quran to see what the Quran says about our scriptures. Now, before I do that, I need to qualify my use of the Quran. Obviously, as a Christian, I do not believe the Quran is revelation. So it holds absolutely no authority for me. Yet the Muslim does believe the Quran is revelation from God. So whatever the Quran says, a Muslim must follow wholeheartedly. Now, when I turn to the Quran, I do so in order to see what the first Muslims believed concerning issues such as the nature of God, the person of Christ, and the authority of Scripture. In other words, my appeal to the Quran is for historical inquiry. I want to know what the first Muslims believe. I want to know what Muhammad believed. And in order to know what he believed, I must turn to the Quran because that's the oldest document we have that chronicles the beliefs of the first Muslims, especially and including Muhammad. So this is why I appeal to it. So again, let me qualify and repeat my point. My appeal to the Quran isn't because I believe the Quran is authoritative. 
The Quran to me is a book documenting what the first community of Muslims believed. Yet for the Muslim, however, whatever the Quran says, he or she must believe wholeheartedly. So if the Quran says that the first Muslims believe that my Bible is the uncorrupt word of God, a Muslim must accept that. But the Muslim realizes the dilemma this places them in. If the Quran does say that the Bible is true and uncorrupt, then the Muslim must accept what the Bible says. But since the Quran contradicts the Bible, he or she can no longer be a faithful Muslim, must reject Muhammad and embrace Christ as his or her Lord and Savior. So this is what I call the Muslim dilemma. The dilemma that the Quran puts every Muslim in concerning what the Quran says about the Bible. Now with that said, let's examine some references from the Quran to see what did Muhammad actually believe about the Bible that was available to him in his day? What did he believe about the scriptures that Jesus had access to? Did he believe these scriptures were corrupted? Or did these scriptures remain intact and uncorrupt, preserved by God? Let's examine the Quran to answer these questions. The first passage I'd like to turn to is chapter 3, verses 3 to 4 of the Quran. Chapter 3, verses 3 to 4 of the Quran. Here the Quran describes its function as a scripture sent down to confirm the revelations that came before it. Chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, our brother Lee Block will read. He has sent down upon thee the book with the truth, confirming what was before it. Now before my brother continues, it is vitally important to know that at times when you're reading an English translation, you may not be getting the full picture. The translation may not be accurately translating what the Arabic original says. Because after all, the Quran was supposedly revealed in Arabic, not English. So here in chapter 3, verse 3, the literal translation says that to you we've sent down the book confirming that which is between your hands. It's very important to note this. To you, Muhammad, we sent down the book, i.e. the Quran, confirming that which is between your hands. The Arabic term, musaddiqan, comes from the verb sadaqa, means to confirm something, to bear witness to, to verify as true. Lima baina yadehi. Lima baina yadehi means that which is between your hands, his hands. So what the text is actually saying, the Quran confirms whatever scriptures that Muhammad had access to at that time. Very important to note that. Whatever scriptures the Jews and Christians had access to at Muhammad's time, the Quran confirms as being true, reliable, uncorrupt, because it is the revelation of God. Now the next verse says, And he sent down the Torah and the Gospel aforetime as guidance to the people, and he sent down the salvation as for those who disbelieve in God's signs, for them awaits a terrible chastisement. So note, the Quran says, just like the Quran was sent down from God, Allah God sent down the Torah and the Gospel. So in the context, the scriptures that the Quran confirms as being true and reliable, which Muhammad had access to, are the very scriptures of the Torah and the Gospel, the Injil. Now you ask your Muslim friend, historically, what was the Torah that the Jews and Christians were reading at the time of Muhammad? Historically, at the time of Muhammad, what Gospel did Christians have access to? Well, on historical grounds, the answer is obvious. The only scriptures, the only Torah, the only Gospel that these communities have access to are the very scriptures we possess today, the Old and New Testaments. Therefore, if the Quran is correct, the Old and New Testaments that we have today must be the uncorrupt, pure revelations from God. Because these are the very scriptures that the Jews and Christians had access to at the time of Muhammad, which his Quran confirms to be reliable. Do you see the dilemma? If these are the revelations, and yet these revelations contradict the basic core elements of Islamic theology, the Quran must be rejected and Muhammad must be a false prophet. Which means a Muslim who believes in the Quran must embrace the Bible and accept Christ as Lord and Savior and reject Islam. This is the dilemma. But there are more references. Chapter 3 verses 3 and 4 are not the only text. The other reference that my brother Lee will read is chapter 5 verses 43 to 48. Now as he turns to chapter 5 verses 43 to 48, I'm going to break it down section by section in order to highlight the impact and significance these verses have on our understanding of the Muslim view of the Bible. 
I know Muslims say the Bible's corrupt, but is this the view reflected in the Quran? Was this the view of the first Muslims according to the Quran? Let's see. Yet how will they make thee their judge, seeing they have the Torah? Wherein is God's judgment? Now before you move on, note this is addressing Muhammad to speak to his contemporaries. Speaking to Muhammad, it tells Muhammad to tell the Jews, why is it they come to you, Muhammad, to be a judge, to arbitrate, seeing they have the Torah, and in the Torah you'll find the judgment, the command of Allah. Did you note that? Here the Quran is telling the Jews, don't come to Muhammad. You have the Torah, turn to the Torah, because in the Torah you have God's prescribed will for you. Now here's a question to ask your Muslim friend. If the Torah was corrupted, why is it that the author of the Quran is telling the Jews of Muhammad to turn to the Torah, not to Muhammad, for decision? Why would the author of the Quran have the Jews turn to a corrupt text if he truly believed the text was corrupted? Well, to even ask the question is the answer. The author of the Quran did not believe the Torah was corrupted. He believed it was uh, preserved by God and a reliable witness to the will of God. This is why the Quran is telling the Jews, don't come to Muhammad, turn to your own text. Turn to your Torah, that which you have access to. Continue, Brother Lee. Then thereafter, turn their backs? They are not believers. Surely we sent down the Torah, wherein is guidance and light. So Allah sent down the Torah, and this Torah contains guidance and light. Again, how can a corrupted text contain guidance and light? How can it be trusted to guide you into anything? Supposedly corrupt. Well, this tells you the author of the Quran did not believe the Torah was corrupt. Thereby, the prophets who had surrendered themselves gave judgment for those of jewelry, as did the masters and the rabbis, following such portion of God's book as they were given to keep and were witnesses to. Now, before my brother moves on, note what this passage is saying. The Torah which the Jews had access to at the time of Muhammad was the very Torah that even the prophets of God the theologians and rabbis of the Jews used to judge the community. So what the author is basically saying is that if this Torah was good enough for the prophets to judge accordingly, then it should be good enough for you today at the time of Muhammad. But again, how could this Torah at the time of Muhammad be good enough to judge by if the Torah had been corrupted? Why is the author of the Quran appealing to a corrupt source? Well, the answer is obvious. The author of the Quran did not believe the Torah was corrupted, but that the Torah had been preserved by God and can be used to judge matters and, and issues. Now continue from there, brother. So fear not men, but fear you me, and sell not my signs for a little price. Whoso judges not according to what God has sent down, they are the unbelievers. So Allah says, if you Jews do not judge by the Torah that you have access to, at the time of Muhammad, you are unbelievers. Now that's kind of an intriguing and astonishing uh, statement. If the Torah is corrupt, you'd expect believers to stay away from a corrupt source. But here Allah is saying, judge by it, and if you don't, you're an unbeliever. Again, this proves beyond any reasonable doubt that the author of the Quran did not believe the scriptures were corrupted, that the scriptures of the prophets had been preserved, and that Muhammad and his community had access to them. With that said, in light of all the manuscript evidence of the Bible, we know what the Bible looked like at the time of Muhammad. We have copies of the Bible that were written before his time, during his time, after his time, and they're virtually identical to what we have today. So if the Quran is true, then the Bible remained intact at the time of Muhammad. With that said, we have copies of the Bible that were written during his time that are identical to what we have today. Therefore, a Muslim must believe that my Bible is the Word of God, which the Quran confirms to be true. <laughs>